host, Maggie Hickey. I'm the chair of the Constitutional Rights Foundation, which we affectionately call CRFC. I've been a volunteer with CRFC for 18 years. I've been on the board for 12, and I've been the chair for the last two years. CRFC's vision is to strengthen democracy by empowering students to be the next generation of civically engaged participants. I want to first and foremost thank the CRFC staff, our board members, many that are here, and especially Patty McCarthy and Dan Coton, the chairs of tonight's event for all their hard work. Please give them a round of applause. The work that CRFC does is so important because young people need to learn how to discuss controversial issues so that they are prepared to engage in informed civic engagement, a skill that is so important and many higher ups that we know lack it. Without an understanding of what it means to live in a democratic society, it becomes impossible for people to engage in meaningful self-rule or to protect precious constitutional freedoms that we enjoy. It's hard for those of us in this room to imagine not knowing your constitutional rights. But the reality is the constitutional rights and liberties of all of us are endangered when people neither know them or don't value them. Results of a 2016 Museum Institute survey titled State of the First Amendment show that too many Americans know too little about the Constitution and its significance in all of our lives. The survey found, and this seems almost unbelievable, that only 11% of the respondents knew the First Amendment guarantees freedom of the press. And I'm afraid that maybe our president was one of them. <laughs> only 17% knew it guarantees freedom of religion. Only 2% understood it guarantees the right to petition. 39% percent of respondents were unable to name a single right guaranteed by the First Amendment. Only a quarter of young people reached the level of proficient on the National Assessment of Education Process Civics Assessment. And white affluent students are four to six times more likely as Hispanic or black students from low income households to exceed that level. This disparity creates a civic engagement gap. Our democracy is strong when all young people are informed of our government, democracy, and constitutional freedoms. Students need opportunities to learn how to engage, discuss, and debate controversial issues in a respectful way with people that have different views than theirs. There is a great need for current and engaging curriculum and programs. Teachers also need support and professional development to be prepared to equip these students with the knowledge, skills, and dispositions to be the next generation of leaders. This is where CRFC comes in. We work with educators and we work with students so that they learn about the constitutional principles through high quality, hands-on, nonpartisan civic programs CRFC empowers students with knowledge and skills to critically think and have civil dialogue in the classroom and in their communities. We work with all schools, but we focus on the schools that need us the most. I only have a three minute time allotment, and this is usually when I wouldn't read my notes and I would engage you with all the wonderful stories about CRFC, but I, they gave me three minutes. And so I'm going to just tell you a little bit about some of the programs that I love. Equal Justice Under Law, it's going to be taking place this Friday at the federal building right across the street in the ceremonial courtroom. And the students will come with their teachers, high school students, and they will learn and discuss and debate a recent Supreme Court case, Minnesota Voters Alliance versus Mansky. And last year, the, ca the case was the Masterpiece Cake Shop case. And I had the opportunity to spend the entire day was with the students, and it, what a lively discussion that that case um, allowed for us all to have. And not just with um, CRFC board members, but with teachers, lawyers, and the judges in the building. And it was a wonderful day. And for some of those students, they said it was the first time they'd ridden an elevator to the 25th floor, or the first time they'd ever talked to a lawyer. And almost every day in the city of Chicago, you can find an Edward J. Lewis lawyer in the classroom volunteer in a real classroom teaching CRFC materials. 
We have over 700 lawyer volunteers in over 100 schools. My favorite lesson is the alien comes to Earth and has taken over the United States. And you're trying to explain the Constitution to this alien, and especially the Bill of Rights, and how important it is to you. And the alien says, that's fine, that's fine, I'm busy. I'll tell you what, you can keep five of the rights. Which five do you want to keep? So I just want to leave you that, all thinking about it. Which five rights would you keep, and which five rights would you give away? Now imagine discussing that with fourth, fifth, and sixth graders. It's a lot of fun. CRFC is so important to me because the teachers and the students, they give me optimism, they give me hope that our future leaders will be prepared to take on the challenges that face our city and our nation. And so we are keeping it short, but right now I have a very important thing to do, which is to present the Bill of Rights in Action Award. And this award goes to individuals and organizations who, because of their professional commitment and community involvement, provide exemplary models of citizenship for our nation's young people. This year's honoree is Northern Trust. Northern Trust has provided <laughs> Northern Trust has provided financial support, advice, and guidance to CRFC for more than 20 years. Bank executives have served in leadership roles on our board of directors. Marty Gradman and Dennis Reagan are past treasurers. And a special shout out to our current treasurer, James Quinlevin, who has been very helpful to me as the chair this year. And truly, I became a lawyer, so I was hopeful not to have to do math. So James has been extraordinarily helpful to me during my tenure. Northern Trust is not only a friend to CRFC, but it strives to be an upstanding global corporate citizen by minimizing its environmental impact, honoring cultural perspectives, and sponsoring community programs like CRFC um, in social initiatives in the geographic regions that they're in. But they're also doing things throughout the world. Um, CRFC is one of the important programs that they um, support, but they also support education for students at risk in the United Kingdom. It's an honor to present the 2018 Bill of Rights in Action Award to Northern Trust. Accepting on behalf of Northern Trust is Mac McClellan, Executive Vice President and President for the Central Region of Northern Trust's Wealth Management Business. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> they, the, the floor is yours. All right. Uh, thank you, and um, uh, thank you, Maggie, for those kind words. And also, uh, thank you, everybody, for attending uh, this year's uh, Bill of Rights in Action uh, benefit event. Uh, I'm a first time uh, attendee, so this is terrific. And um, you know what? I had some bullet points, which are right here, that I was going to uh, use to craft my discussion. Um, but I forgot my glasses, and at my age, without glasses, these are worthless, right? <laughs> so I'll just put those aside, so bear with me. Um, but on behalf of all of my Northern Trust colleagues that are here today, there's a few here, uh, thank you for uh, this award. And uh, it's very meaningful, uh, and it's an honor, uh, because we hold uh, CRFC in such high esteem, uh, the great work that's done to educate the youth in our community about uh, civic rights and about the Constitution. And uh, we have been so thrilled to be a partner of the organization for so many years. Maggie touched on a little bit of this. I don't want this to be an advertisement about Northern Trust, so I'm going to make this really short. But we, uh, in our 129-year existence, have all been all about our DNA, our culture, about giving back uh, to communities in which we serve not only our headquarters here in Chicago, but around the world. We're a global company. And um, the, our uh, association with uh, CRFC you know, goes back a long time, I, I think over 25 years. Um, and we try to give back to the communities in which we serve in a number of different ways. Sometimes it's a direct financial contribution to worthy organizations. Sometimes it's in kind and with other types of donations. And sometimes it's just 
advocating for our employees, for our partners to get involved and to be part of organizations as members or on the board of directors and James Quinlevin, who's the treasurer and on the board and the executive committee of CRFC now is a good example of that. Our association with CRFC goes back over 25 years. Um, Maggie mentioned a couple of names, um, but uh, I, I, I do want to recognize Marty Grabman. Marty, if you could stand up. <laughs> Marty was instrumental. Uh, Mar Marty at uh, Northern Trust is a legendary banker. I mean, uh, he has, I mean, there's a room, a conference room in our headquarter building named after Marty Grabman. That's how important he is to our firm. And uh, for many years, he was a board member, he was uh, the treasurer, and then when he retired, um, uh, Dennis Regan, who you mentioned, uh, who ran our professional services group for many years, uh, assumed the responsibilities on this board that Marty had. And then when Dennis retired, um, that's when James took over his current responsibility. James, you're not gonna retire anytime soon, are you? No, please don't do that to us. <laughs> um, in addition to the board participation, uh, we uh, do provide uh, some financial funding uh, for CRFC, and it's unrestricted, and it's unrestricted because we want the organization to have as much flexibility as possible in terms of being innovative and creative and using those uh, contributions uh, as impactfully as possible. And that human and financial support uh, is because we believe in what CRFC is doing. And to provide the youth in our community with an understanding of our Constitution and to prepare them to be actively engaged um, in their civic responsibilities in the future, what could be more important? And it's a little disheartening. Uh, Maggie mentioned some of these stats, um, but um, uh, you know, some say that civic knowledge in this country is at an all-time low. I think it's picked up a little bit in the last couple of years, uh, but it's still at a pretty uh, low point. There's a very important uh, public policy institution that did a research, uh, I think about two years ago, that said only 26% of American adults, only 26% of American adults uh, know the names of the three branches of government. Uh, so that's a pretty low bar. Uh, and that's why we need CRFC to continue their uh, educational programs, their problem solving programs, just the dialogues that they have with elementary and secondary school students um, so that uh, they're going to grow up and become more uh, understanding of the Constitution, more understanding of the importance of being involved and engaged. And you know what, um, the people that will be inspired by the work that you're doing are the kids today, in the future, they're gonna be sitting in this room many years from now, they'll be our community leaders. They'll be, dare I say it, future attorneys. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and they will be future members of CRFC. Uh, so I'll just uh, uh, finish by saying our quarter century plus uh, relationship with CRFC has been really very gratifying. We are very proud of the relationship that we have. We want it to continue for the next quarter century. And on behalf of Northern Trust, we thank you so much for this award and so much for this recognition. It's a great honor. Thank you. And I promise to find the plaque. Not sure where it is. Um, next, I have the privilege of introducing our guest speaker, um, who is no stranger to CRFC because he held the role I have right now as chair and was a longtime board member. Our speaker is Alex Dimitrov. Um, he caught national and international attention this fall um, with his Law 360 article, Thinking Like a Lawyer. Alex is president and CEO of GE Global and drives GE's international growth by connecting capabilities in more than 180 countries where GE does business. Alex's 360 piece emphasized listening to both sides of an argument, which came as no surprise of us to uh, those of us who knew Alex as a board member and the former chair. 
The CRFC first met Alex when he was a partner and successful trial lawyer at Kirkland & Ellis. A graduate of Yale College and Harvard Law School, Alex brainstormed, inspired us all as board members for 13 years. And he was our chair in 2004 through 2006. We crossed over only one year. He brought us intelligence, practicality, and a point of view that helped CRFC plan for the future. He helped secure funding and reached thousands of students in the Chicago Public Schools during his tenure. At one of the last benefits that Alex attended, our founder, Carolyn Pereira, who's here, lost her ability to speak when Alex surprised her and announced a three-year $100,000 GE grant. This grant helped develop and distribute many of CRFC's core classroom materials like State versus Wolf, State versus Roberts, and Green versus River. And now you'll all get to learn about that if you volunteer to be a lawyer in the classroom. Um, from his Chicago roots, East Coast experience, and now a worldwide role, Alex brings us unique insights tonight in the importance of appreciating the rule of law and the rule of civil discourse. We thank him for joining us, and please welcome to the podium. Uh, thanks, Maggie, for that very kind introduction. I, I couldn't be happier to be home here in Chicago when to be honest with you, I got married in this room in December 5th, 1987. Jill and I got married right at the two empty chairs in the front row. And I can always tell when I'm speaking to a group of lawyers because the back bench tradition continues. You fill in the back and always leave the front empty. So it's a familiar sign. Um, congratulations to Northern Trust and thanks for your support of CRFC. It's awesome. Um, what I want to talk about tonight isn't the happiest of topics, but it's a necessary topic for all of us to talk about right now in 2018. And that is this increasingly uneasy sense we have in our country that despite the work of CRFC and organizations like Facing History, we feel like our country is at risk of being ripped apart at the seams. So let's be honest for a minute. It's hard for anyone to feel good about the Kavanaugh confirmation hearings, regardless of which side you were on. It's hard for anybody to feel good about the campaigns that were just concluded earlier this month. Again, regardless of which side you were on, including what I thought was an especially nasty race for governor of this great state. It's hard for anybody to feel good about the extraordinary way in which President Trump and the media went after each other the day after the election, again, regardless of which side you're on. And what's even more distressing to me as I look at our country is how tragedies of the sort that used to unite our country, even if only for a couple days, now serve only to exacerbate the tensions among us. So for example, the feud between Senator McCain and President Trump cast a pall over a majestic funeral in National Cathedral that in times past would have unified leaders from both sides of the aisle in Washington, D.C. The bombs that were recently delivered to Democratic leaders across the country gave rise to painfully few calls for unity, with politicians on both sides of the aisle preferring to debate whether blame for the despicable and criminally deviant actions of a crackpot belonged to President Trump or the media somehow. And then the recent tragedies in California, Pittsburgh, and elsewhere have too often given rise to these hollow statements of solidarity that were delivered with much less sincerity than the ensuing attempts, often in the very next sentence, to try to lay political blame for the hateful acts of racist, anti-Semites, or the deranged. So, it increasingly seems as though any tragedy, no matter how awful or unspeakably sad, has become fair game 
for instantaneous political recriminations in the United States. Where's our sense of decency? What's happened to it? So some people say the warriors like me or alarmists who read too much into what they try to reassure us is politics as usual. I've traveled around the world in my job at GE. And you know, it's certainly true that when George Washington retired to Mount Vernon and the founding fathers, the rest of them began to run against each other for president, they called each other names that would make some of President Trump's tweets seem pretty lame by comparison. But to me, at least, the difference in the United States now, some 250 years later, is that the campaigns and the incivility of those campaigns never stops. Pretty much everything is being politicized these days, 24-7 on social media, on cable TV, by talking heads who operate on the premise that being loud makes them persuasive somehow. Now, as Peggy Noonan recently put it in an especially thoughtful rendition of her column in the Wall Street Journal, America's never really been fully at peace and friendly because, you know, that's not our style. We like a good debate. We like to mix it up. But still, as a country, we're losing our sense of calm because of our inability to get together and get things done like we've always been able to do in the past. And in my view, it's giving our country a collective panic attack right now. So what are we going to do? You know, I mean, moreover, the pessimist in me says that our unique system of government right now, where one chamber of the legislature is based on population and the other chamber is based on geography, is a recipe for perpetuating this divisiveness. I mean, think about the recent elections. The Democrats have represented a majority of voters, but the Republicans have dominated geographically. By virtually any measure, bipartisan and compromise, bipartisanship and compromise have become quaint notions of the past. And it shows no signs of changing anytime soon. Just a couple statistics, and here's the point in fact. So 10 years ago, there were 17 states with one Republican senator and one Democratic senator, which was pretty low by historical standards. In January 2019, there's only going to be seven. I mean, think about that. Seven out of 50. 43 states are going to have senators from both parties, the opposite of bipartisanship. So against all of this backdrop, it's no wonder that people are increasingly worrying about the state of political dialogue in our country. Indeed, to the point that universities around the country are launching workshops, classes, special dinner programs to teach students how to engage in civil discourse and cope with hard-edged ideological disputes of the sort we see all the time. I remain hopeful. And I remain an optimist in the future of our country. And I believe that you should, too because the answers are right there in front of us if we want to seize them. But we have to want it. Um, when I think of these civility initiatives, they take me back 35 years ago, my first year at Harvard Law School, and Professor Clark Bice, who was my administrative law professor. Curmudgeonly, Clark Bice, who was inspiration for the legendary Professor Kingsfield in The Paper Chase. And anybody who's read the book or seen the movie or attended law school knows that the most valuable lesson the law schools teach is to think like a lawyer. And here's what I think that means. I mean, to me, thinking like a lawyer means respecting the views of people who disagree with you. It means listening. I mean, really listening to both sides of an argument, making sure that people on both sides of an issue are afforded a fair opportunity to state a principal case. Now, it does not, contrary to the impression of some and those who give our profession a bad name, mean winning at all costs in a relentlessly adversarial system where you do whatever it takes to win. Instead, thinking like a lawyer in the right sense of the term, ultimately means believing in the power of ideas and honoring the conclusions of principled and reasoned debates. 
So I'd submit to you guys tonight that in these turbulent, challenging times, the world needs fewer people who profess to be open-minded, and instead more people who really and truly think like lawyers. Now, as I watch what passes for political discourse these days on Capitol Hill, I don't think it's a coincidence that we have fewer lawyers in Congress than at any time in our country's history. Although I will say that the one positive that came out of the 2016 and 2018 elections is that politicians lost any right to tell jokes about lawyers, let alone uh, anybody else. But ironically, the value of thinking like a lawyer is highlighted the most by people who complain the loudest about how lawyers have been taught and trained to resolve contentious issues of consequence. So we've all seen the t-shirts, mugs, and posters with that famous quotation from Shakespeare, first thing we do, let's kill all the lawyers. But here's the catch. The people who cite this quotation to bash attorneys don't realize that when Dick the Butcher uttered this exhortation to his fellow revolutionaries, he was actually paying lawyers a huge and profound compliment. Um, because at the time of King Henry VI, lawyers were regarded with huge respect as essential gatekeepers for the rule of law in civilized society. And I'd submit to you tonight that the same holds true for leaders who think like lawyers, and our country needs as many of them as we can get as soon as we can get them. The solution is right there waiting for those who are ready to seize it. Now, we're mostly lawyers here tonight, but for those of you who are worried that I think that the answer is to require everybody in the world to go to law school, I, I don't want to go that far. There are additional steps that we can take to turn down the temperature in our country short of mandatory legal training. So the first is it's imperative to continue and build on the work of organizations like CRFC and Facing History and Ourselves and other organizations who equip and empower teachers in our junior high schools and high schools to teach our children and grandchildren the power of ideas and the grace of civilized discourse. Uh, how to think and respectively engage with one another with ideas and reasoned debate. It's not as easy as it sounds. Why the term civil rights is anything but an oxymoron is a lesson that we can't teach to our kids often enough or urgently enough. When I think about CRFC, sometimes I think we could do a better job of tracking the careers of our CRFC graduates. I'm willing to bet they've made an enormous and positive difference in their communities one person at a time. On behalf of a grateful community, I can't thank the board, the staff, the volunteers, and the teachers of CRFC enough from the investments that you are making in our children and our future leaders. Second, let's make sure that elections matter. And let's ensure that uncivilized behavior by candidates and incumbents carry the appropriate consequences for them. You know, in this respect, I'm encouraged that 114 million Americans showed up to vote this month. Now, that's fewer than the 138 million who voted in the 2016 presidential election, but it's a lot more than the 83 million who showed up for the midterms in 2014. As a direct consequence of this turnout, the next House of Representatives is going to have more women, more people of color, more members of the LGBTQ community, and more Muslims than ever before in the history of our country. In other words, the House is at long last truly becoming the people's house. In the end, if you, shit, if you set sheer politics aside and in an honest moment of truth, how can any Republican or Democrat be against that? How can they be against the enhanced legitimacy that comes from reflecting the people that the House is supposed to represent? The silent majority of Americans who yearn for civil discourse 
should not have to settle for professional politicians who dwell in divisiveness and make no effort whatsoever to make our system work. We should seek out and vote for leaders who are capable and want to explain and make principled arguments for the things they believe in. Leaders who carry themselves with dignity and respect ours. To quote Peggy Noonan once more, show some largeness. We're dying from smallness. I'm convinced the candidates will get more credit than they imagine possible if they surprise us by rising above today's politics and returning to a less divisive brand of politics and reason discourse. When you show respect for people, they tend to return that respect. It's that simple. We just need someone who's big enough to go first. And then it will follow. I'm not naive, trust me. I'm just hopeful, and there's a big difference. Third, businesses like GE need to engage. It matters. I can hold out the experience of my own company here. GE has grown from an American to a global brand by becoming a local company with amazing teams in the more than 180 countries where we do business. Commercial ties serve as a foundation for engaging on human rights and bridging differences between cultures and governments. Whenever or wherever we show up, we bring our commitment to integrity, dignity, and equality. That's a good thing. We work in some tough places. We're not perfect, as you've seen from our recent challenges that the CNBC guys love to talk about. But decades of experience in competitive markets and industries have taught us that to succeed, we have to show up. And you have to fight hard for what you think is right, especially when things are not easy. Businesses don't get a pass on what's happening in places where they do business. My professional experience at GE and with other companies over the past 35 years have taught me that companies and law firms can have a profound impact on their communities. Let's rededicate ourselves as a business community to reasonable and responsible discourse. We can do it. Now, in this respect, it would be impossible to overstate the role that lawyers and law firms can play. So if you'll allow me to briefly lay claim to being a lawyer for just a minute again. Um, we're a profession with a great tradition for change as catalysts for promoting what we think is right, justice, in our jobs, through our pro bono activities, and through volunteer organizations. Time is hard to find. Everybody's busy. But we can't allow our busy lives to completely get in the way of realizing our larger aspirations, aspirations like returning this country to a level of civil discourse. And finally, we must get back to embracing our differences and our different heritages as a source of strength that is unique to America. Again, I'm privileged to be able to cite GE as an example of the power of diversity and inclusion in action. Diversity captures all the many ways in which our employees around the world differ. And inclusion means developing environments in which all of those different employees can participate, reach their full potential, and in the process, empower a company like GE to reach its full potential. Reflecting the richness of the communities and cultures in which we operate around the world fuels GE's innovation, fosters a limitless source of idea, and manpowers our teams to bring the best of GE science and technology to bear in their countries. So at GE, our past 125 years, let me think about that, 125 years of experience have left us convinced that a company that aspires to change the world has to reflect the mosaic of that world. When you think about it, and when it comes to gender equality in particular, 
how in the world can any company authentically aspire to tackle the world's most challenging issues in aviation, healthcare, and energy without including or excluding half the population of the world in the process? Diversity and inclusion is common sense. It's the smart thing to do, not only the right thing to do. And this notion of bridging cultures and embracing our differences that America needs so badly right now is personal to me as a first-generation American. Uh, I'm standing before you this evening as living proof that the American dream can be more than a romantic ideal. I'm the son of Russian parents, Valentin and Alex Ye, who came to this country almost 60 years ago without knowing a single word of English, and by virtue of their incredibly hard work and fearlessness and determination, made incredible opportunities available to me for which I'm always going to be grateful. I'm never ever going to forget the huge smile on my dad's face when I was inducted as a White House fellow back in 1985, a couple years before I got married in this room, and President Reagan said to a room full of proud parents with my dad sitting in his seat at the cabinet table, that only in America could an immigrant hope to see his son get a job working for the President of the United States at 27 years old. So I say that not to brag about what I did when I was 27, but to brag about my mom and dad making that opportunity available for me. And despite whatever pretenders to President Reagan's legacy may say today, it remains a unique source of strength for the United States that people around the world want to live in this country and become citizens of America. But sometimes, I'll be honest with you, as I listen to today's debates, I ask myself if my parents would have been able to persevere if they'd come to this country today. Uh, I also ask whether I would have been able to persevere through the more challenging moments of my career, and I had plenty, if I hadn't been a white male who could speak English without an accent. I don't know. And I've been asking myself this question with a heightened sense of urgency as a father of three daughters and uncle of five nieces who are just beginning their own careers. And amidst all this personal reflection, I've also come to appreciate that there would be no GE as we in the world know it without our smart, dedicated employees from all over the globe, of all nationalities, religions, ethnicities, genders, sexual orientations, and races. So this evolution of GE and my own personal evolution over the past 59 years from growing up in the relative seclusion of central Illinois to becoming the CEO of GE's global growth organization have taught me that genuine inclusion equals humanity and respect. Think about that equation. Genuine inclusion equals humanity and respect. That's what CRFC teaches. That's the principle on which this ter terrific organization is founded. And those are the principles that have driven the work of the Constitutional Rights Foundation for years. So let's please keep at it. Your support's needed more than ever. The CRFC is needed more than ever. America can be really hard. America can be really complicated. But man, oh man, is it worth it. We are different. There is a respect for ideas. There is a respect for reason discourse in this country that's part of our tradition that the rest of the world just doesn't have. It's worth the hard work. It's worth the CRFC. We are a beacon of hope for the rest of the world, so let's keep at it. It's worth the investment of our blood, sweat, and tears, believe me. Thanks for your time. Thanks for listening. And now I need to turn it over to Kathy Miller.
Hello, I'm Kathy Miller, Executive Director of CRFC, Constitutional Rights Foundation Chicago. And um, I, I agree that these are very necessary topics, and thank you for this, Alex. It's something that we deal with at CRFC every day. Um, as the Executive Director and working on this event, I really would like to tell you that, as our supporters, I would love to give you just a big group hug. You make such a difference. President Obama has said that against impossible odds, people who love this country can change it. And I'd like to introduce you to a few people who work to change it every day. Um, our professional staff to begin with. Um, Gary Coleman is our chief operating officer and tonight our photographer. And after 32 years, in February, Gary is going to be retiring, and we are going to miss him. So thank you, Gary, for that. <laughs> Dee Runnis is our program director, and she runs our controversial issues programs and also our Supreme Court-related programs. Um, so Dee, back there in the white, thank you. Tiffany Watson is our Education Director. <laughs> Tiffany, Tiffany administers the Edward J. Lois II Lawyers in the Classroom program. She's grown it immensely. She also runs our action-based civics programs. Um, our newest member of the staff is Sarah Calvillo, who you met out at the front table. She's responsible for much of what's gone on today. Um, it's a wonderful staff, so thank you. I also want to introduce uh, two representatives of our Civic Leadership Council. This is a group of young professionals um, who are getting older every year that we keep making them do volunteer work and, and put on the most successful spring benefit we've ever seen. So I'd like to introduce Josh Bajoni. Josh. And Tim Jones, who's involved in like volunteers for all of our programs. Thank you, Tim. Um, this year, in 2019, we're going to have a lot of new initiatives, and I hope that you will all be reading your newsletter to hear about them. But for those of you, the new people in the room, please put your business card in the bowl out there for a drawing for the Duck Inn. Um, which was graciously given to us by our chairperson, Maggie Hickey, whose brother is our, the chef, and he's also been a resource person for us. Um, uh, I would like to just remind you, before we finish the evening, that by supporting us through our teachers, our professional staff, and our large cadre of wonderful, dedicated volunteers, you transform democracy from paper to reality for school children, students across Chicago and the metropolitan area. So I want to thank the people who put this on. I want to thank Northern Trust and Q. I want to thank uh, Alex for coming all this way to speak to us and share it. And I want to thank you. I hope to see you back here next year for our 40th, 45th anniversary celebration. And now the bars are reopening. Thank you.